how much is it health and how much is it taste as well? Sure. So he's asking whether we have other concerns. Yeah. Ask your question again to Ashley because he's just come in now. Yeah. I don't want to misquote your question with all respect. Okay, please uh, just put it simply. When you think about what you eat, yeah. what, do, what are the considerations that come in, into your mind? Okay, so as I'm a Muslim, yeah. so for me the first thing is it should be halal. The term halal itself is quite broad in the terms that it is something that is permitted. Yeah, sure, bro. Okay, inshallah. You're in good hand. Yeah, so halal is basically permitted uh, food that in our scriptures, so it's something that's permitted by God Almighty. Yeah. And it's wholesome, obviously. So the rights of the animals are also taken into consideration. Like we can't just sacrifice an animal that is for example, uh, that's uh, disabled or it's uh, got a broken, you know, even a horn or something like that. So they say this is um, from one of the etiquettes of what we should eat as being permitted in Islam. What, what exactly makes something halal? Is it the way, let's say, it's slaughtered? It's what the Quran has permitted. So it's also the types of animals. For example, for us, pork. So even if it's slaughtered correctly, it is something which is haram, which is not pro which is, it, is it not permissible. It's seen as like a, a prohibited. Is, is it because in the past it was seen as like a dirty animal? Or what was the what is the reason? Yeah, so there are certain animals which God has told per, uh, not permitted us to eat, and it's not only it's not only uh, pork. It's also, for example, carnivores like uh, tigers, lions, yes, and even um, um, I think even birds which are carnivorous like vultures and so on uh, so these so there are many animals which are not permitted so the main thing is that basically i'm wondering why okay so i that, I'm fair, that's that's fair so that's basically your tradition yeah it's, that you, you have yeah. certain animals that you decide you, should, you can eat and you cannot yeah. same in, based on what yeah, God told us yeah, basically. Based on what God has told you. And then yes. even so in then obviously Western society you have the same thing, for example, obviously we don't like eat dogs, even though that has obviously been tradition elsewhere in the world. And yeah, I think and the Chinese like them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and then um and obviously we're much more willing to eat just like, oh yeah, cows, pigs, all of these, all of these other animals. But then the question is do you think the decision to eat one animal over the other is a bit arbitrary? No, it's not. Like I said, for us, it is what God told us. So it's not really arbitrary. It's in the, in the sense that we have been instructed by God mm. what to do and what not to do. And that relates to all matters of life, not just dietary needs. Yeah. yeah so for example, even though there might be a person who might be, uh, say, your, your opposite gender, uh, she might be a really good person. Yes. But you can't just be like with her like a boyfriend and girlfriend kind of relationship you know what i mean in islam we have to get married yes uh, before you can have that sort of relationship so every aspect of your life is something that is governed by what god dictates rather than what the country dictates or what our own whims and desires dictate uh, so for example even things like interest and usury you know this is not permitted whereas in the western world today no one bats an eyelid, you know, like every single financial uh, establishment practices it, isn't it? Like you can't have a bank that doesn't take interest or gives interest, you know what I mean? Yeah. So if you want to buy a house as a young man like yourself, you know, you wouldn't have the kind of money to purchase a home today in this country. So what do you have to do? Rely on the bank, right? And they can lend you £100,000, but by the time you finish paying them, it might be the double of that, depending on how much interest they charge you. So this is the, the life in, uh, for the Muslims is something that is governed by what God dictates. The life of, uh, similarly, I think in other religions, they have, like for example, in Judaism, they have a similar sort of uh, uh, aspect where they do have the do's and the don'ts, uh, which is dictated by God based on the Torah for them. So the Muslims, they have a similar thing, which is dictated by so, what the religion says in the Sharia. Then my question would be, so when it comes to, I guess you could call it like the, the principles and the um, rules for how you how you live, you could basically call like morality. Would yeah. you say the morality is 
essentially separate from God, and then God is the person that's sending those morals to you, or would you say that God is is morality in in its in, in his in himself, or is God essentially like just commanding any principles that he desires? So like basically, how do you see like morality fitting into God? Yeah, so we believe in something which we consider to be objective morality. Mm. I don't know if you believe in a similar concept, because most of the morality today that, that we see in our societies is more subjective, isn't it? Uh, Unless what, the law dictates in, in what sense otherwise. Do you mean, uh, what, what do you mean by objective, by the way? So objective means it, it, it's consistent throughout the centuries. It doesn't change unless God instructs you of certain things. For example, for us, the morality comes from God. So like I said, he tells us about the do's and the don'ts. Mm -hmm. And those are the morality principles for us. I told you about uh, relationships which are something extramarital, for example. Those are our morals. And I consider them as objective morals because this is something Throughout the um, centuries, when God sends down revelation, He hasn't permitted people to just sleep around, you know, they, when they feel like. There has to be a marriage, there has to be this legal uh, consideration within the, the religion, uh, with, uh, uh, within the confines of religion, mm. that you can't just marry anyone. It has to be uh, within a marital uh, contract. So, for example, in this society, you know, people have girlfriends, they have one night stands, they sleep around, there's no sense of responsibility. When you have children, they abort them. You know, this, this kind of um, aspect in life is something that is, I think, from our own greed, our own needs, our own desires. You know, it, is, it doesn't take responsibility into consideration. Do you think, because you just explained there some of the reasons why that yeah. would be bad, why sleeping around would be bad, and actually just having a very strong relationship till death do us part kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously there is a, there's the aspect of divorce if, they, if it's necessary. Yeah, yeah, or, or basically just yeah. uh, just a strong man uh, marriage, not like, yeah, basically having loads within a lifetime, essentially. Yeah. Which you've basically explained like, oh, it's... Um, it's greed, uh, greed that, that's bad if that's the case. Also, it's, you're not being responsible and stuff like that. Surely that shows, the further you're giving reasons other than just, oh, God said so, means that the morality is not something... Arbitrary, it's not I, arbitrary. The way, I see, yeah. the way I see that is, the way I see objective um, morals would be that they're something built into the universe in some way, or whether that's God, or if you're atheist, well, I'm, personally, I'm personally agnostic, I'm not, I'm not actually sure whether there's God. Okay. I, what do you mean built into the universe? You know, the universe, the universe doesn't well, have consciousness, I, I, I so think, I think it, it cannot have, govern good think, and bad. Yeah, yeah, well, I think that it, it would have to be that way, because because that's the only th that would be the only way of explaining having these somehow tr moral truths because they would they wouldn't they would have to somehow like be separate from humans and then humans no, get no, to know them almost no, like absolutely not facts. look when you say separate from humans you know first you need to realize that everything in the universe mm. other than us you know the humans yeah. and we Muslims we consider there are other creations like the jinn and the angels but right now we're talking about the humans yeah. the humans decide good and bad isn't it most if you look around most of the time the the animals they they don't have the sense of morality or rationality that we do so we uh, we do, need to we need do, to separate they that do have a sense of morality even do they if, yeah not not to the same extent but yeah do. like what morals like would some some something like a praying mantis would have <laughs> you know what i mean no, uh, okay, so... So the okay. praying mantis, no, when, no, it, I wouldn't say when it mates with its, uh, 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 with its male, <laughs> you know, after the mating, they chop off the head I of the male. Agree. I would agree. So, with, I would say <laughs> so let's, not, let's not even bring an animal no, kingdom no, into this. No, no, what I would say is it's not, it's not all animals, but I'd say it's the animals that are more social that have essentially groups and are within groups and therefore need... Because basically morality is... I see it as a way of making groups cohesive, 
making them essentially like you know fit together well and having rules that people can stick by so that problems don't occur. No, but you you need I to think, realize. Look, I there's a difference between it. animal kingdom and our societies. For example, if you look at even if you look at the the chimpanzees, which are supposed yeah. to be the most, let's say the most um, uh, clever animals out there. Yes. Even if you look at within their uh, their groups, yeah. the alpha male is going to copulate with all the females. Doesn't matter whom she's a partner with. So let's let's please, you know, if you bring in the animal kingdom, it just gets messy. Because we need to understand we have to compare like for like and not apples and oranges. So let's stick to the to the to, to human beings for now. Yeah, I, I do believe ultimately yeah. Even if, Mora when you speak if, about morality, I always even if consider I, even humanity. If I, I, I personally believe there, there probably maybe is a bit in like the animal kin kingdom. It's so, it's so far different to what it's like in humans. Of course it is. That That's what I'm telling you. It's different. As well. Yeah, let's not compare uh, yeah. things which it's are apples better. and oranges. Let's compare like for like. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's get back to the... The yes, human, is, human world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that, look, when it comes to morality, yeah. what is your, what is your baseline? But as in found, foundational. Yeah. Principles. Where, where do you get your morals from? What I'd say is, it's to do with well-being. That's what I'd say. So it's, so basically, if actions make people suffer, then they're clearly bad actions, and then any action that reduces suffering more so is a better action and then from there you just develop like rules and that basically basically on average will make society better there might be certain scenarios in which those rules might not be right like let's say um the rule so it's, it's all based on your happiness index is um, that what you're saying i would say in general yeah okay in, in so let's be, say if somebody yeah. somebody feels really nice mm. and happy and good yeah. If they drive at 70 miles an hour when the limit is 30. Well, and he says, I'm a great driver. I'm not going to kill anyone. I'm, I'm a model driver. So will you, okay, would that justify his morality? Uh, or no, her morality? It wouldn't, it wouldn't justify that because, because um, it's, I didn't really specify hard enough. Because uh, for you, it's it's it's, it's to it's do not, with just, whether you're happy or or you're not. Happiness. It's about the collective's happiness. Exactly. So exactly. That's what I'm telling you. Yeah. Look, when you talk about morality, but then you are you talking about subjective morality of every individual out there, or you're talking from from a society societal perspective? What do you mean by subjective? Subjective means every individual have their own, has their own understanding of good and bad. Um, like I gave you the example of this f driver mm -hmm. who is an adrenaline I, junkie and he wants to drive that, at a fast speed. I believe there are probably right or wrong answers in what makes people happy and therefore people deciding that, oh, subjectively this is going to make me happy versus another person disagreeing, I think they're mistaken into thinking their mindset and they should really realize that we should essentially listen to what what all these rules that are actually like less. sorry listen to what we should listen to um, to what to s someone who's let's say an expert let's say when it we're in with the example of like the driver yeah so the driver who's going at 70 instead of 30 yeah we should listen to an expert saying look um this is going to cause some serious damage to other drivers and if we let this happen then that will cause even more people to think it's okay. Yeah, but where is and this kind of an expert? Where, What makes you think he's going to listen to an, an expert? What if another expert counters this expert? Why? You know, you still have a problem then. Um, no, because... If yeah, you have someone like Lewis Hamilton who is a pro, you know, race <laughs> driver and he knows how to handle a car yeah, yeah. quite well yeah. on a race circuit, let alone on these roads. Yeah. Yes. He says, I'm an expert. What are you going to do then? An um, expert in the sense of knowing, knowing what um, will make the, like basically make the welfare of people the best in that scenario. Yeah, but who decides on such an expert? That's the question. Who decides that? Do you know of any such expert? Well, I mean, in certain contexts, yeah, you would just, you'd have like, I know. You know, there are medical experts 
who say today even a small quantity of alcohol is bad for you. Are you going to listen to them? Do you drink alcohol, by the way? You don't drink at all? Uh, no, I've had a bit. Exactly, yeah. So now, you or anybody else, you know, who goes down the pub and has his social life, you know, to be with friends, drink a few pints, yes? Earlier you said you're going to use your basis as these experts. Now the experts are telling you even a small quantity of alcohol is bad for you. Do you expect the entire community in, in Great Britain to abandon alcohol now? Well, clearly they're not a good expert. That's the main thing. What do you mean they're not good experts? These, mean, these, these, these are experts that publish their findings in The Lancet, which is a medical journal, peer-reviewed. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely experts. Well, what are you going to do now? I mean, Okay, so the, the I mean, the reason the reason I said experts is because it's a, um, I guess a proxy for knowing what will be good based on like research and stuff like that. Yeah. And because not everyone in the world, let's say you wanted to know more about the universe or something like that, you could try and like study everything, do the experiments in the world, and then work it out for yourself. But you'll probably just listen to some guy like Stephen Hawking or someone else like Brian Cox and try and work it out. And the same with that. So with the alcohol example, ideally, the expert would be trustworthy. Clearly not there. Well, I gave you the Lancet, you know, that's quite a trustworthy medical yeah, yeah. journal. Yeah. Now, now wait a minute. Now, if people are not going to abide by the, um, by the findings, by the investigation of these experts, it comes back to subjective... But no, understanding, no, but no, but isn't it? Well, because no one can enforce finish. those rules, isn't it? I'll just finish my point. I was just saying, yeah. what you do then is look at the study, because a lot of studies, they can actually have some faults in with them. Because for example, not once it's peer-reviewed. If they're peer-reviewed, then I'm not actually sure how that came about. But basically... What Are you fighting against the experts now? <laughs> <laughs> the very standard that you, you want to use your, as a baseline. Hold on, once again, let me ask you this question. So once the experts mm. have told you not to do something, mm. are you then obliged to listen to them? Yeah, if you can trust them, then you and, and their, um, their objectives in mind or goals in mind. So are, you're not going to, when you say you, you can trust them, what do you mean? Let's say they are, they, they are well trusted in their field. Now, yeah. if they tell you, for example, if they tell you stop drinking, mm. are you, you expect yourself, your family, your friends, to all stop drinking based on their finding? Uh, or you're going to go, no, hold on, you know, it's my life, you know, my body, I want to have fun, I'll go down to the pub as I do always, and enjoy my pint. I mean... Let's be, let's be realistic, a, what will people do? No, but there's, there's a difference there between yeah. what, because... I, basically, I believe there is a difference between what's right and then also what people like will actually do. And so, in that case, you're are you you're asking more of a question of oh, just human nature. Will people just be essentially just continue to do their bad habits as usual? And I believe that probably is the case because it's hard to change people. Yeah. But then, because I was talking about morality and about the ideals, yeah. I'm saying that in an ideal world. You would have the expert who you could trust and has ideals, uh, the right ideals in mind. They filter their information through to the public, and then the public change their lifestyles accordingly. To yeah, but who who believes in such a system? Do you know any any of your friends who believes in such a system? What? So you so, so can I get I, right? So my question to you was: mm. What is your baseline? And you told me experts. I told you my baseline no, no, or my no, no, no. objective my baseline, morality my is based on what my God well tells me. And then in order to achieve Yeah, that, but well-being, I give you the yeah. example of alcohol, okay? Everybody knows alcohol is harmful for your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, yeah. that has definitely has to, yeah. you have to take on board that that is talking about your well-being. Yeah. But then nobody listens to this, to the experts. In real life scenario, that, no, in real life like scenario, that, subjective morality is based on what every individual thinks is right for them. Um, I, personally I don't think there's anything like objective morality in our societies, other than if you're if if you listen. Oh yes. yes. All right, that's fine. Thanks, bro. Yeah. Uh, what I would say, just quite simply, is the people that 
don't listen to it are probably just mistaken. No, but I'm asking you, who listens to such a principle which but you just is, is postulated? That, is, that is, that, the, is that the real is that world scenario principle. you're giving me or is that just is, something that you think is how the society should be governed? Wait, say that again? This principle you gave me about listening to experts, yeah. do you know anybody who does that? Why, why is that? Because that's your baseline. So yeah, I'm asking you, where did you get this from? Because that, surely it just like makes, makes sense, right? To whom? To, I mean, at least to me. Exactly. So yeah. it's subjective. That's what I've been telling you all no, along. Everybody has their own notion of what is right and wrong. And they think this is how it should be done in the world. But, surely, but then that is good for you. But earlier you said, no, this is for the society. Surely, I said, no, this is not for the society. Surely, Every but, individual in the society defines what is good and bad for them. And that's how... That's what we call this freedom of speech, freedom of expression, mm. freedom of religion, all these things, you know, in a democratic society. For example, there are many people who might get offended by certain speech, yes, about someone of their religious figure in, yeah, their, yeah. in, in their worldview or someone even in a political setting, for example, yes? Yeah. So what are you going to do? In this country, you have the right to offend. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe You see that. what I mean? No, I believe that now, exists. Now, you're talking about morals. Now, where does morals come in if you have the right to offend? You remember earlier you told me about being happy, about well-being yeah, yeah, and yeah. also on? But it, this society is such which gives you this right to offend. I, be, I mean, I believe you should be able to debate stuff out and stuff like that. But well, welcome to Speaker's Corner. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we do stuff like that. How yeah? exactly? Wait. How does ability ability to to offend? Uh, it impacts your well-being, isn't it? Not working well, but there are many people who might get offended, mm. who might get depressed from that offense, yeah. Yeah. who might go have some some fo form of anxiety. Yeah. Okay. So all these things are something which are not in sync with the well-being that you were mentioning earlier. So this is the thing. So I believe that. Um, one of the, where in order to have a high level of well-being, you should also have freedom as well, and that's freedom to essentially think your mind. Debate, is it is it absolute debate, freedom? Debate. Uh, what would you what do you mean by absolute freedom? As in, say, like any any particular words, any yeah, any ideas? absolute freedom in the sense that, for example, in certain European countries, mm. you cannot deny the Holocaust. You'll be arrested and you'll be sent to jail. Um, I believe, on the whole, I believe you sh it's, it's really hard to say, but I believe all I can say at the moment is I think the level of free speech should be increased to what it uh, increased from what it is at the moment. I, I don't know whether the absolute freedom would be the best because then anyone could go around saying anything. So it's uh, unfortunately my answer would be oh yeah it would just basically be some some point between oh yeah middle level of freedom of speech yeah but that's absolute. my friend sorry I didn't catch your name Theo Theo, Theo yeah. yeah so Theo who decides that middle point um, it's you know we all we always come back to this decision maker mm. because there has to be someone who decides someone who is respected someone who is um, who's got authority. For me, that is God Almighty, so I, I'm very clear about my uh, standards as to my baseline. For me, it's God always. No one knows us better than God Almighty. Yeah. Yes, you are an agnostic, so it cannot be God for you because you're unsure about God, whether he even exists. Mm. So what is your baseline? Because you, you talk about many things, but when we actually um, look at that and we, 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 we just dig in a bit deeper, yeah. It turns out that there is no such standard. So, uh, as in, in society currently? Your standards. Because um, I'm sure everybody in the society will say different things if I ask them. Yeah, I, I mean, I believe people would just have different uh, views. But I think on the whole, that what I believe is because each person um, believes their own well-being to be essentially the most... I think for most people, their well-being to be the most important. Yeah. And then people around them, less so and less so. Yeah. We should essentially take that and think, well, if that's the case for all the people in the society, then the general thing that we should do is essentially increase the average well-being or something like that. 
There is no, nothing like that. This average well-being which you're talking about yeah. is again subjective for different people. For example, there might be, why I don't know, it, it's, do, do you consider... Why is that against? Because yeah. I just said, if, I said, if you're assuming that you want to do it for, if, if you want to take into account the whatever the desires of other people, and then you're essentially making well-being one of the found, foundationary principles to allow that to occur. Yeah, but there is then, no one definition what? of well-being, is there? For example, look, mm. telling lies might be perfectly normal mm. in certain um, fields. Yes, for example, the lawyers, they lie all the time about the clients just to win. But then there is the well-being of theirs and their client. Okay? Yeah. But what about, the, what about the opposite party who might be actually telling the truth? But because this lawyer is quite respectful and he's, he, he's got all these tricks up his sleeve and he's able to lie his way through and win the argument. Mm. And the judge is going to rely on the, uh, the jury. And the jury is uh, fully sold by the argument presented by this liar, lawyer, whatever you call him in this situation, is going to obviously win the argument and they are going to decide in his favor. So you see, this is not how it works. In Islam, we have a principle think, yeah. about, no, no, just, it, just one sec, yeah. we have a principle about, being, about justice to be quite high. You know, in the Quran, there's a, there's a passage which says that even if, if the justice is something that goes against you as an individual, means the person who is telling the truth, establishing justice, even if it goes against your own self, against your own family members, against your own people, then also you should maintain um, honesty and justice. Now, if, you, if you're saying, you know, earlier, you, you correctly pointed out that everybody considers their well-being to be the priority. Mm -hmm. And that is very true. We are a selfish uh, society and we would want the best for ourselves, regardless of how it's going to impact other people. But when you have something like objective morality, then that selfishness takes a, a second place. Yes, the first, the first and the most important priority is to ensure that you do not offend God, you do not upset God, you do not disobey God, because that will be your detrimental, something that is going to be a, a consequences you're going to face in your afterlife, which you have no control over. Yes, because that will be determined by your honesty, your justice, and your morality in this world, and your obedience to God Almighty. And this is what we mean by the purpose of our life in this in this world is basically is what God has governed for you and you obey and worship Him and not disobey Him. But you see, when I asked you questions like this about morality, everything that you talked about as a, as a standard, it falls apart. It comes back to the individual rather than good for the society, good for um, uh, the world at large. Well, the, the, the point I would make is because, because we care, about hopefully because everyone should uh, because because you've obviously got each person cares about their own well-being but that's multiplied by x times then in order for on average the you can't people, you can't multiply x times because your individual morality is not the same as somebody I'll else's just, wait I, i'll just go through it and then you can yeah sure you can respond. so you times that by x times and then in order to satisfy the greatest number of people, the, the actions that should occur within the society should be actions that don't just help, you know, one person here and there. It should be ones that help loads of people, let's say, like having massive, uh, important, like educational institutions and like, I know, particularly good, like workplaces and all of these other uh, all of these other initiatives rather than just giving like one person loads of money or something and therefore and therefore from that you can definitely justify having a justice system based on even if even if at the root of everything it's individual well-being because because we're living in a community where the, the community wouldn't function if if it was just that one person and and you had to kind of take the consideration of all the other people that also care about their well-being. Surely... Are you talking about majority, well-being of the majority, yeah, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, surely. Okay, let me, let me give you a scenario. You know, in South Africa yeah. during the apartheid period, okay. yes, yeah. the majority of the governing people, the rule that the well-being of the white people mm. is going to be now 
the priority. Okay? So this is not one individual. This is the society of the elites at that time who were ruling. They decided this was a well-being for our society. Similarly, with regards to in Europe, with Hitler, when he was in charge, he said the well-being of the people is that they should all be this Aryan race. Yes, and every, everybody else is secondary. Yes, and that's what ended up into the Holocaust, you know, discrimination of millions, uh, torture and killing of millions. So what you just said doesn't really work even when, it, when the majority of the people I advocate it. I don't think they were truly caring about the majority though, though. Because they were, they were obviously discriminatory towards certain groups within yeah. the society. So those groups were minority. So the majority ruled that this is how we are going to rule our country. We don't care about the minority. So your majority principle doesn't work. But then also the, the general attitude um, will make the uh, will make the majority also just unhappy because No, the general attitude was all these Aryan race, they were quite happy with it. Because now they are given all the privileges, the priority, and the, the minorities are actually discriminated against. So your majority principle doesn't really function. In fact, even in a democracy today, mm. yes, the majority of the country were against the war in Iraq. Do you remember that? You're, you're not that young. I mean, you, I'm sure you remember the time when the majority of the people, they went, went against the war in Iraq. Oh. When they had no... I guess that's a bit different because that's majority of opinion, one's majority happiness. So like Sorry, majority opinion was this? Majority, of, majority well-being, so it's a bit of a... It was the well-being of the people in Iraq, my friend. <laughs> Who's, whose well-being are you looking at now? I don't know. Is it, is it the race here? Is it the country here? In fact, the country here also decided not to go to war. The Iraqis didn't want a war. The Brits didn't want a war. I'm sure there are many Americans and many Europeans who didn't want a war. But this small number of politicians who rule this country, they decided, yes, we got this dodgy dossier. In fact, the United Nations did not give them a permission either. They went on their own because there was a lot for them to gain and very low risk for them. So they would send this 17-year-old, 16-year-old in the front lines, yes, the poor Americans and many Europeans who died in the war. And not, not, I'm not even mentioning the millions who died in Iraq, you know? At least a million people died because of this dodgy dossier and this so-called uh, excuse of weapons of mass destruction, which they never found. In fact, they are the manufacturers of the WMD, the Americans and the Europeans, not the Iraqis. But who paid the price based on this lie which was perpetuated? So this majority doesn't work. This democracy doesn't work either. Not that I'm against it, I'm saying that right now what we have here is good, but it's not ideal, it's not absolute, it's not perfect. Okay? So this, we have to then rely on the one that we believe who knows us the best, and that is God Almighty. Have you had any exposure to Islam? Have you read about anything um, in Islam? No, not particularly. Um, right. I guess I've I maybe seen a few videos on YouTube. And, okay. Uh, I know a couple of people who are Muslim, but... Right. Yeah, fair enough. Um, would you like a copy of the Quran if he gave you a free copy? Oh, yeah. That'd be yeah, great. okay. I'm sure yeah. one of the brothers will get it for you. But what I want you to do is, you know, study Islam and look into it and how it is something that helps not only the individual but the society as, as at large. For example, if you look at all the things that Islam has prohibited, it will make the society a much better place. For example, alcohol, gambling, fornication, adultery, uh, usury, you know, taking interest and all these things. So all these things are prohibited in Islam. Now, if you look at each one of them individually, you will see how many lives it saves. Yes, how many families it saves from breaking up. Uh, how much it helps you financially also. Because today, I think majority of the budget of the NHS goes into training, uh, treating people who have been impacted by alcohol directly or indirectly. Yes, every Saturday evening you go and look at Oxford Street, you know, down there, Leicester Square, those places where there's lots of uh, nightclubs and uh, pubs and so on. Yes, you find people who are well educated, even academics, puking on the road in the night. So these same people who are respected in the society, who are looked upon, you know, as people 
having good morals, having someone to listen to, someone who's going to be your role model and your mentor. If you looked at them at that night when they were fallen on the floor, yes, drunk and puking on the street, not even knowing where they are, they might be stripped completely naked by their friends as a joke and they wouldn't know it until they woke up in the morning. So that is alcohol. Yes, take gambling for example. Um, I don't know if any of you remember Peter Shilton. He used to be the goalkeeper of England during the World Cup. So quite a popular goalkeeper. He had a bad habit. He developed a bad habit of, of gambling. Yes, and he lost everything. His family, his uh, self-respect in the society. Um, he lost, uh, I think his, his, his marriage as well broke down. He lost his money, he lost his value, everything, just because of gambling. And the amount of people it impacted, along with him, you know, his friends who lend him money. He had to literally lie to go around to borrow money from people to fulfill his addiction to gambling. This is what it... Yeah, yeah, sure. You, you want the mic? Oh, it's in there, it's in there, the mic's there. Sorry about that. So yeah, it's, the gambling also destroys not only the individual, but the people around you, your family, your friends, everyone, it impacts them. So these things which Islam has prohibited, it has, it is something for the well-being of everyone, including yourself. Yes? So everything that Islam has prohibited, you will find some good in it. Yes? Because Allah says in the Quran that the alcohol, it might, there might be some good in it, there might be some benefit in it, but the disadvantages, the harm outweighs the benefits. Yes, and we see this, you know, throughout our society, throughout, throughout our, our life, we see many people who have been destroyed because of this alcohol. So you, pe person like me or person like somebody else who is a complete teetotal, you know, they could be walking down the street and get knocked down by someone who is drink driving. Yeah, so come Christmas, yeah, what, what are we now? Almost November now? Yes, in a month's time, there's going to be Christmas. Yeah. And then you'll have these advertisements on television. Don't drink and drive. Drink. The next ad, drink responsibly. Yes? So on one side, they're pushing the alcohol with the caveat, drink responsibility. Yes? And if you ask every alcoholic, they'll tell you, I used to be a responsible drinker. Yes? When he, he didn't become an automatic alcoholic. Yes? He had the same caveat, which he kept telling himself, that I drink responsibility. I'm a responsible person. But he ended up being an alcohol. Because that's what alcohol does to your mind. Yes? Your sense of judgment is something which is now not there. So it, 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 it corrupts your mind to such an extent where you think that you are doing the right thing and you will not be responsible. But by the time you, you actually gone over that threshold, you don't even realize it. And you not only harm yourself, you might end up killing someone. Yes? How many families have broken up because of this? Yes? How many families out there are actually just single mothers today. Why? Because of this partner of theirs who had been drinking a lot, abusing the wife, abusing the children maybe. So what happens? You end up with a society which is kind of broken, you know? All these broken families, they lead to a big broken society. So what we are doing here is that we, if we abide by what God has told us, that is good for you for your entire life and good for the society. Then we can actually use the money that the taxpayers pay in a, not to treat alcoholics and alcohol-related um, abuse and alcohol-related diseases at the hospitals, but we, we can put it to good use. Like you said, the well-being of the people. That is the real well-being, my friend. Get rid of the things which you as an individual think is right. This is what we call abiding by or letting your whims and desires rule your life. Let God govern your life, which will be more holistic, much more beneficial for the society at large. You know? So I want to touch upon another aspect which you brought, brought in. You, you mentioned you were an agnostic. Yeah. Have you ever looked into religion or you, have you always been an agnostic? Um, I mean, I was, I was Christian up until maybe about 15 and then also in apparently like roughly 20 years old. So, okay. Um, <coughs> So, <laughs> so what so, made yeah. you move away? So I guess it was just, it was, I wasn't particularly um, 
practice. Like when it when it came to Christianity, I just went to church a little bit, yeah. and then just slowly faded away. It wasn't so more of a culture tradition was, rather than yeah. It was it practicing. wasn't it was partly because it wasn't particularly strict, but then also I just didn't seem to find um, much like much sort of good reason to believe in a god in the sense of like I couldn't see any strong evidence or str like there basically weren't things in the world that I could necessarily attribute to God rather than just some other cause and, and and then stuff like evolution I was like well this pretty strongly like um, contradicts what what um, any sacred text says and therefore I, I can't really believe in a God if it's suddenly disagreeing with some scientific principle that's quite strongly bad. Okay. So, so what uh, you, I'm assuming you, you're, you're keeping science as a standard for, for, for that decision? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, basically just okay. um, essentially I'll just, I'll, I will at least I hope to have a scientific out, uh, outlook and I try to use that across the board. Okay, fair okay. enough. So let me ask you a question. Mm. Where did the universe come from? <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you use science as a. No, as, <laughs> make sure you use science as your standard now. <laughs> because if you're going to go by science as a standard, you're going to you're going to leave science now. Because science doesn't have an answer to this. Yeah. So ultimately, what what I do is, so if science doesn't have a view on something at the moment, it doesn't have any evidence of what it was like. Well, so I, I believe in the Big Bang, and so the Big Bang though. I don't know whether that was the start of the universe, if there is a start, or whether that's just some some event later on. And therefore, what I would say is, all I know is the, um, there was expansion from the Big Bang, but I don't know what happened beforehand, and I don't know what the what the um, what the universe is like in the sense of uh, what it does with time. I don't know whether it was just started, whether it was there the whole time and then there's a big bang or whether it's maybe some kind of loop let's say the universe is like let's say looping around it's if you if you those are those you, are so if, what if do you, you mention any, about yeah you don't have any evidence of what it was like beforehand you just say well i don't know and i'm not going to come up with some theory of what it was like Basically, yeah but you know these are all theories anyway what you just mentioned no, 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 I'm saying that that's what people could come up with, but I'm saying I'm just going to... I'm just Okay, let say, me... Let me I'm just going to say all I know is the Big Bang, yeah. and then I'm going to... Let, let me reduce it down to cause something. and effect, yeah? Yeah. So we believe that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Mm. Now, obviously the universe began to exist. Yeah, I don't think there's any any credible major scientist uh, field out, science field out there in cosmology which, which postulates that the universe was eternal. Okay, they all say that it had a beginning something like 13.8 billion years ago so it is something which is finite because right now the universe is expanding you know that are you aware of that well aware of what the, that the, the universe is expanding no no that yeah yeah with that but i'm saying the universe began to exist yeah so um, because it's expanding how they do is they actually trace it back to where this expansion happened yeah, and yeah, they yeah. narrow it down to uh, the Big Bang and then before that, just before that, which they call before the Planck time, is the singularity, which is this dense matter which kind of exploded into this Big Bang and so on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, look, it is finite and this is what they have come to the conclusion and th there's Who, who's the scientists, the cosmologists. So you, you, if you look at the cosmologists who work in the NASA, they will tell you that it is something which is, uh, the universe is something like 13.8 billion, billion years old. Are you aware of that? I thought that was just. Um, I guess this is pretty much across the board. It's we, not. It's not something no, that no, is. I know that, I know, yeah. Well, that's that's the Big Bang. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but we don't actually know whether that was the start of the universe. Well, from from all the cosmologists, I'm just saying that's the, this is the most uh, accurate it. model according to them. There are other models, but those models are more of more of like mathematical um, yeah. equations which they have come to saying, okay, this is mathematically possible, yeah. but you know, mathematically infinity is possible. But if you look at the reality, there's no such thing, isn't it? Okay, so at the moment, the best we've got is based on that, it's based on like, well, I think it was something to do with yeah. the distances of galaxies. Yeah, the, the expansion. That, and the fact that the, the 
the um, the galaxies that are further away are traveling at high speeds and then from that you can work out where all the galaxies came from and how long uh, how far back in time yeah. they were and so that's how they compute the time this 13 point billion years what they look at the the fact they, they calculate the expansion rate of the universe yeah. and they do this by the stars not just the galaxies so far away stars as well and they look at how far apart they are like moving yeah. based on that they calculate reverse calculation and that's how they come to the age of the universe so anyway i mean no, no, the bottom I mean, line the I bottom line that. is been, it's it's finite i think the conclusion from that for me would be yeah the best we got at the moment is we we would assume that the universe exists i, I guess yeah i don't know yeah, existed. Through. It began to exist at some point. Oh, yeah, that's okay. that's what we have to. That's all we need to understand in, in order for us to know that this is an effect, not the cause. So the question comes down to what caused the universe? Was it always there? Most of the scientists disagree that because of entropy itself, this is something which is not possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there are many other factors which makes it impossible yeah. for the universe to have this much energy that it is going to be there for infinite time. Secondly. Um, did the universe come from nothing? Again, which is an impossibility, because nothing cannot bring about something. Do you agree with that principle? I think when it comes to things within the universe, yeah. something can't come from nothing. But when it comes when it comes to the universe itself, it's pretty hard to know because if the To know what? That the universe created itself? So the thing, like the, the way I think about it is, if the universe did come from something, yeah. then that something, by definition, because the, what I see the universe is being defined essentially everything. Okay. If, if that, if the universe, everything came from something, then that that something is also part of the universe. And no, it's not. Because no, the universe didn't exist. I'm talking about before the universe was caused. What caused it? But then what brought it into existence? If you look at cause and effect, yeah? For example, uh, if I boil water, mm. yes? Then I'm going to see some steam coming out. Now the heat is what caused this steam, yes? Okay. With the, from the medium of the water. Yeah. The, water is, the water evaporates and it creates this steam. So that is yeah. the cause. The cause is the fire, effect is the steam. Yeah. Okay, similarly, we know that the universe began to exist at some point, yes, 13.8, let's say 14 billion years ago, what caused it? It cannot have caused itself because it didn't even exist. It cannot come from nothing because nothing doesn't exist. Do you agree? I mean, it's... Okay, it's, it's quite counterintuitive. How? But it's... Can nothing create something? To me, that's pretty intuitive. It doesn't. Because nothing doesn't even, even exist. Just like, you know, nothing and the term infinity, these are concepts for us to understand, for us to build mathematical models and formulas. It is, it is a, it's something which is abstract, like the numbers. Yes? Wait, wait, just, just go back on the nothing stuff. Okay, nothing to me doesn't exist because I define nothing yeah. as the absence of everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I... I agree, I agree with that, but... So you agree that nothing doesn't exist? I mean, I, I, at least in the universe. Yeah, of course in the yeah, universe, yeah. yeah. It doesn't exist in reality. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, Okay. Like, for example, if you go into deep space... Anywhere. Yeah, nothing doesn't exist. It's just a concept. You think it's, there's nothing there, but there's still these, like, uh, small particles and stuff like that. Yeah, that's not nothing. And so, and so yeah, that, yeah, that's definitely the case. So, are yeah. we good on that, that nothing doesn't exist? Yeah, I mean, okay, so it's within the universe, just as a... Within anywhere. Nothing is a concept, my friend. It doesn't exist in reality. So I can denote I nothing as a zero. You know, when I'm, when I'm writing, yeah. let's say, a formula, yeah. I can denote nothing as a zero. That is showing me that is nothing. Yeah. Okay? But in reality, if I asked you, show me nothing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You see what I mean? You won't be able to because in reality, it doesn't exist. Mm. Now, if something that doesn't exist like nothing... How can it bring about something like the universe, which does exist? Okay, so we can rule that out, that nothing cannot bring about the universe because nothing doesn't exist. The universe couldn't have created itself because the universe didn't exist. So what 
is the other alternative that's left. What is the cause that brought about this universe into existence? I guess, I guess the whole thing is cause and effect is something that we only know as being part of the universe. Yeah, it's pretty scientific, you know that, cause and effect. And we can't possibly, we don't know whether, how it works outside. No, no, we do. I give you the example so, of water, heat. No, that's within the universe. Though. Of course, that's within the universe. Yeah. So, so even outside the universe, you cannot think outside the universe because everything that we know is what is within the universe. So all those people who talk about multiverses, about this cyclic universe, they haven't seen it. It is something which is more of an opinion. Yes, so even if it's discussed among the scientists, it's more of an opinion. It hasn't even reached the stage of a theory, like the Big Bang Theory. You know, opinions start with postulations. So this is how science works. First they postulate something that, okay, there is a probability that this can be real. Then they have a peer review. Then it reaches the stage status of a theory. Now it's something that they all agree with. Okay, this is the only plausible cause for the universe to come into existence. So they can only go up to the point where time and space allows them. Because without these two factors, time and space, they cannot formulate theories even. Yes, they cannot formulate, they cannot even imagine, they cannot think. Everything beyond that point is pure speculation. From the, if you're looking at pure scientific basis only, using scientific standards. So then you'll have to use things from philosophy like inference. And this is what I'm giving you as inference. Like what caused the universe? We believe that every, every effect has a cause. Yes? So the cause and effect principle should also work within what created the universe, what brought it about into existence. Now we already ruled out no nothing. We already ruled out the universe itself creating itself. Yeah? That is like a mother giving birth to herself. We cannot, it's, 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 a, it's an impossibility in reality. So what is, what is the only thing that's left? Plausible, Second? It is plausible though. Because... What's plausible? For a mother to give birth to herself? <laughs> no, it's no, not no, possible. No, no, no. The, the, um, the universe, so, you could, I mean, you could imagine maybe a universe going through, collapsing. The universe? A universe having its normal trajectory, uh, tra trajectory yeah. and then it's collapsing and then expanding like the Big Bang and then that continues again. So you get expansion, then collapse, then expansion. Yeah, in theory that is good, but no, no one can prove that. In theory it might sound good, but this is something that no one has ever observed. There's no data, scientific data yeah, yeah, out there, no, no, which it, makes it possible. It's just whether it fits what, uh, My friend, look, you know, if I'm just going to, I'm just going to imagine things, I can, I can imagine a pink elephant flying. Are you going to believe that? No, no, I'm just saying that fit. I'm just saying that fits. And then, and then I'm just... What fits? What do you mean? It doesn't fit. I mean, I mean... It doesn't fit the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. So it doesn't fit scientifically. Um, okay, yeah, assume, okay, assume, that is true. Exu, assu, uh, assuming things get further apart and there's more disorder. Exactly. <laughs> then, at least within this universe, the, we would assume that it wouldn't collapse back into a point and then do some other stuff again. Yeah. So yeah, well, basically, do you want to, I'll, I'll go on to the point of there is a cause for, and you, the effect is the universe, then what would you say, like, could you describe like more about that cause to me? Like, what do you think? That's the thing, I'm, that is the question I'm asking you. Yeah. What caused it? So we can, you know, using inference, I can rule out things. Yeah. Like, like the way I already did with regards to nothing, with regards to the universe causing itself. So the only other, the only other option we have left is, is about an agent or entity which brings about this universe into existence. And for that agent to exist, for that entity to exist, it, it itself should be self-existing and not caused by something else. Otherwise, you'll have this infinite regress, you know? Uh, yeah, I agree that has to be the case. Yeah. Um, how do you make, sh like, how can you make sure that it has that quantum? Uh, Unless you show me any other alternative, I believe that is God. 
If you don't want to use the term God, you can say, let's say, some supernatural being, supernatural power, whatever you want to call it. Because we don't believe that the universe or the physical reality is the only thing that exists. I believe also in the metaphysical. Like, like for example, if you look at your consciousness, yes, you, can, you do not have empirical evidence for consciousness. You cannot go to the lab, conduct an experiment, and say, yes, I can see the, my consciousness under a microscope. What, do you, what would you say consciousness is? is uh, so consciousness is normally defined as uh, your awareness of your environment, about yourself, yeah. yes? So there were philosophers like uh, Descartes who said that uh, I think, therefore I exist, that, therefore I am, yes? So the fact that you, you, you're thinking and you're conscious of your environment, so that is consciousness. Now, if I asked you, do you have any empirical evidence for it? I mean, you could try and dissect a brain and try and, like, try and do that. No, I mean, the main thing is, would you, do you think there's something separate from the brain, so like a soul? That's right, that's what he's on. No, we, we, we believe, look. Where is the location for that consciousness? Yeah, right now the location is not important. The important bit is whether you agree and acknowledge that you have consciousness and if you do then the question arises on what basis do you believe and not know believe, <laughs> that you have consciousness I believe, I believe, uh, yeah. doesn't the consciousness exist in the, in the heart how do you know that because in the quran god speaks about the the, the apple being in the heart yes i mean as so we don't believe the consciousness has one seat for example would you say someone who doesn't have a brain has consciousness no, because everything's interconnected. There you go. So we don't we don't pinpoint it to one location. That's the reason. So we believe all these major organs that you have is also some somewhere some uh, within that is a seat of consciousness. But the heart but, is still beating yes. even if there's no consciousness. Yes. The heart uh, still no, no, no. It's all connected, like you said. That is the correct answer. I know. So Allah says in the Quran, they have they have eyes, but they but, they, but their hearts are blind. Are blind. You see. Exactly. So this is what this is what is defined as because the heart is one of the major organs. The major your brain is also one of the major organs. Without either of them, you're dead. It has to be a balance between them. Yeah. So we don't know. Right now, the question is not where where the seat of consciousness resides. Right now, you need to acknowledge number one that you have consciousness. Number two, what is the evidence for it? Because you you said earlier that you use science as your basis. Yeah. So I'm asking from the scientific perspective. You, you are going to deny your own consciousness because you don't have evidence for it. I mean, I guess to the level of like, you can... I mean, when it comes to science, I don't know whether psychology can... It's, it's hard to say whether psychology, yeah, psychology is, a, is part of science. It is, it's a field within and science, yeah, if absolutely. That is, if that is the case, yeah. then you could definitely report like believing that you, you have awareness of... How do you know? Somebody could create... However, however, consciousness to the level that it's something that would be there even if like parts of your brain were taken away, then that I don't think is scientific. No, no, and no. Then, parts of your brain can be taken away. I've, I've, seen, um, I mean, to this I, I've seen doctors who have actually uh, had half, had removed mm. half the brain of someone and they were still fairly conscious. I mean, certain cognitive abilities were not there, but they were still conscious, yeah, absolutely. So imagine if somebody created a, this really um, futuristic artificial intelligence tomorrow, yes? And the psychologist would ask them the same question they ask you, and maybe that artificial intelligence answers better than you. So what, what do we conclude then? I mean, yeah, it's really hard to say because the, at least, at least, just based on like a science perspective at the moment, you would view your brain as in the, I guess, in the way that you might view like a computer. But then, so with the neurons being essentially like circuitry, and then, and essentially wires and stuff like that. And then, you have the only difference, I guess, is that you could, you produce like different hormones and, and produce different. You are, the chemical signals. Yeah. And the, well. the, the, the electrochemical signals that is within your brain, yeah. that is not consciousness, if that's what you're trying to imply. No, no, I'm, saying, I'm saying if that is what your brain is like... No, but that's not consciousness, my friend. 
those electric impulses yeah, yeah, are not consciousness that is traveling within your brain. I'm, I'm saying at the moment, so if that is all we know so far, then it doesn't seem to like allow any space for any extra thing that's like special. But that is not consciousness, so I don't know what, what you are talking about. And so what I think maybe... No neurosurgeon will tell you that is consciousness. But sometimes not everything is science though. There are things yeah, yeah, I'm unseen. Saying, I'm That's why I asked him about the principle, because his principle is science. Is, is, do you, are you fully science? Uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I do physics and stuff like that. I see. Do you believe in metaphysics? No. no. Why? That is where your consciousness comes in, my friend. <laughs> by, by hook or by crook, you're going to believe in it. You know why? Because there is no evidence for your consciousness. And this is something, I don't even have come across this phrase, the hard problem of science, sorry, the hard problem of, of consciousness. Go and look it up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is something that yeah, the yeah, scientists yeah, no, will never be able to solve unless they start believing in metaphysics. I mean, why wonder is, I thought that maybe consciousness is the process of your brain doing stuff. So it's basically when, um, Let's say when you like are trying to when you're thinking or something, things are things are happening in your brain. Yeah, of course. And it's the it's the essentially the, the process. It's the um. It's your thoughts. It's kind of like the. It's your, your own, thoughts basically. Yeah, it's the, so your process, the process that takes place within your brain, it is what. It's the it's, hierarchy. It's, like it's, it's, it's what your consciousness is basically. Your the fact that you are aware of it's the environment. Yeah. Like but yeah, is. you see, look. We know what consciousness is, but, but the I question is, what is the evidence for it? Your consciousness is metaphysical, whether you like it or not. Well, what is is, is metaphysical so anything that is, that's yeah, any, anything that you cannot, obs anything that is not matter, basically. Yeah. Yes. So, what the naturalistic science deals with is mostly matter and energy, okay, which they can actually measure, they ca they can see, they can observe. They can experiment on it, yeah. and this is what empirical evidence is. That's the reason I asked you, what is the empirical evidence for your consciousness? And you will, trust me, you know, with, with, with just believing in the physical world, you will not come to the conclusion of what your consciousness is. Yeah, yeah, I you have to rely on so the far, metaphysical. Yeah. And besides, you know, for example, let me ask you, do you think there is such a tool which can measure your emotions, for example? which again emanate from your consciousness. So if I ask you, do you have a pet? I do, currently do not. Okay, you had one? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. So if I asked you when you had a pet, yeah. do you love your pet more than your mom? No. You could have answered that. <laughs> you know, you can answer that because obviously you know it. Because consciousness is all about your personal, your subjective yeah. awareness and well-being. But if you, if you were to tell the scientists, can you prove to me whom I love more, they can't. Because there is no such device that they can say, okay, this is what measures love. You know, so cat versus mom. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they don't have such a tool, you know? I, I do, basically, what I think is the, the human body is so complex. So, for example, the brain and all the, all the different chemicals, like whatever it is, like yeah. serotonin, dopamine, all of these other ones, adrenaline, all of these other chemicals. Yeah. They're so... There's such like a big con concoction of them within your bloodstream and your brain and everywhere that when you do have an experience and that is, I believe, the result of certain concentrations or whatever of these different chemicals, it's because, because that is the case and that's hard to measure because you don't have these machines where you can just like, you know, measure absolutely everything in the body straight away then that's why science can't do it currently. No, no, they can measure what they can see, what they can observe, what they have evidence to measure, okay? For example, if they wanted to measure your blood glucose, well, they I can do that. that. Only, if they wanted to measure, uh, for example, the type of blood you have to see, yeah, yeah, but all those things they can. So more, things which are, yeah, things which are, which they can observe, which they can measure, yeah. they can do that. But things of which they do not even have the empirical evidence of its existence, there's no way they can do that. Because that is something beyond. Look, With not everything the, not everything that is... Say again? With the example of the pet and the mother, yeah. surely a scientist... It's beyond the scope of science, trust me. Really? It is. Emotions are subjective. 
So, for example, an, an actor... I don't know what you mean by subjective, if it's just personal to... Yeah, it's, it's something that only you know. So, for example, an actor... Only you an know, actor can you act in such a way like, that it is, it is clear, it is believable to you who is observing him. Okay? So, the actor can pretend to cry. Yes? Pretend to show certain emotions of love, for example. Yeah. Yes? But he's acting. And that is what makes him a good actor. But you, someone who might not know that that person is actually acting, might believe it, you know, when you see him the first time. Yeah, yeah. Yes? But that's why you have to look inside that body. In order to you see. can't. That's the thing. I don't think there's any such tool I to see. I currently at the moment, no. Look, I, if I, there was such I a tool, trust me, to if that. there was such a tool, which measures, for example, if you're being honest or dishonest, you know, every output will have one. I mean, lie detectors <laughs> are all right, but still not. Yeah, right. people can, you know, people can actually trick the lie detectors because it's a machine right uh, all they need to know is how to how to trick it, it how it works pretty hard to fool them, yeah. no but they have yeah. people have fooled those machines okay they're not foolproof and that is a, that is the reason what I'm telling you is that your consciousness is something you don't have evidence for but every scientist out there believes in it you know why because without that they won't be able to ask questions they won't be able to reason they won't be able to perform those uh, experiments they do they wouldn't be able to be a scientist. In fact, they wouldn't be able to be a human, let alone a scientist. Because your rationality, your emotions, all those things, what is the processing, what is processing all this? It's your consciousness. I think it's a similar to thing, um, basically, I don't know whether they're believing it because they want to. They have to. It's not they want, they want to, to, they have to. Because the thing they is have no choice.